to different countries to help them how to organize and how to develop chess in schools. So I work with several countries right now where I try to help them how to organize and how to develop chess in schools. But before I start with this course, I just want to tell you a little bit of my story. Uh, I learned to play chess when I was about six years old. Uh, I loved the game immediately, started to play a lot. And uh, then I kept on playing. I was rather talented, so I became, when I finished school, I became a, sometime a part-time professional, traveling around Europe to play and became international master and so on. But when I was about 25 or 24 years old, a big change in my life happened. It was a very little boy uh, who was about six, seven years old, who came to me during the Swedish championship. I was you know, in the lead, well, I think I was number second in this Swedish championship or something like that. And he asked me, how do I do to become good in chess? And I was just about to tell him, you know, the normal answer. You can do, go to the club, you can read books, you can go to trainers and so on. But I said to him, I will call the Swedish Chess Federation and I will ask them uh, what they do for talents like you that wants to become good in chess. So I called the Swedish Chess Federation the next day and I asked them, what shall I answer to this kid? And the Swedish Chess Federation, how does, does this pyramid look like? What is your idea on, on these kind of kids that want to become good in chess? What does it look like? And the Swedish Chess Federation, they say, well, we don't have this kind of system, but if you like, you can do it for us. And you, those of you who work with chess, you know how dangerous it is when you give your little finger to a federation, they grab you by the arm and drag you in, and suddenly you are responsible for everything. So the next day I started to try to build up a structure of, of how the, this pyramid should look like in Sweden. And soon I was in charge of this in Norway as well. So I worked in Norway and Sweden with developing chess and chess talent. So for 10 years I was working with talent developing to, you know, to create grandmasters to, and so on. So I've worked with a lot of grandmasters to help them to, to become as good as possible. But 10 years ago <coughs> I made a new Swift. The reason was I had one problem with all my kids that I was training, all these talents. My biggest problem was that they were so good in school. And this might be a joke, you might find this as a joke, but actually that's a problem because when they come to me, or their parents come to me and they ask me, should my son or daughter go for chess or should they go for school? As the cho in charge of chess, I should say to them, skip school, only go for chess, this is the most important thing and so on, go for chess. As a father and as a human being, I had to sell, tell them, I think you should go for school first, then you can go for chess when, you know, and so on, because that's, you know, to become a professional in chess, it's very difficult, you know. But then I started to, so, so this is what I told them, you know. What is the problem is, of course, then they normally are lost for chess. They will not become, you know, the best in the world for chess. This is the problem for them. Very welcome here. And, uh you can also take some some uh, sightseeing program and uh, oh, what else? And I need also give you badges. <laughs> okay. And uh, I am a chess organizer. I am uh, one of the managers of chess in Slovakia. Uh, now we have commission under the Slovak Chess Federation. The chairman is sitting behind us. Uh, yeah, I organize also seminars like this, and I will support you by all necessary materials and then do this uh, administration stuff. To uh, you will have these certificates, and then uh, Jesper will tell more yes, about we'll soon it. Come into the look at a little bit about ECU and the survey that we have made where we try to find out what it looks like in different countries of Europe. The second part of today we will have discuss how to play and how to learn. 
We have a special method called the playing method that I really recommend to use for the younger kids and for the beginners. We will discuss a little bit about the classroom, how you prepare the classroom, how you do a good lesson. We will look a little bit at uh, the history and the language of chess, teaching how the pieces move. Should you use a code of behavior when you have chess in schools? And then we go into a practical moment of all play, all tournament that you would all test different mini games in. Part three today will be about chess thinking. Next, we will do a ladder tourna tournament. Uh, then I will introduce you to two concepts that I think is great to use when you work with chess as an educational tool. It's the SMART method and it's the method of questioning. It's two didactical tools that can be used both in the classroom but actually also for every chess instructor. The second day, tomorrow, we will, I, I hope you can make it to two o'clock because otherwise it will be a bit tight so I will start the course at two o'clock. If there's a problem for anyone to come at two o'clock, please tell me after the course and we can discuss how to do it, you know. But then probably we will just briefly go through what, uh, what it looks like in Slovakia with chess and schools. Then we talk about checkmate uh, as a concept of how to teach it. Uh, we do uh, some exercises, we go into notation. We will do a little bit of a Swiss tournament. We will discuss about how to solve disputes between the children. Then we we'll go into how chess can be a social tool. We discuss how you plan a term in the best way, how you plan a lesson in the best way, and we discuss a little bit about what kind of technologies, uh, possibilities is there for chess. In the end, at about, I think, uh, 4.30, there will be this online test, or if you don't have a computer with you, it is also possible to do it on paper, and if you succeed, what that I think that all of you will do, most likely, then you will get a certificate, the ECU School Chess Teacher Certificate. Before now, I would like us to start with working in groups of four, and I want us to discuss this type of topics. What are the challenges when you teach chess? What are the benefits of chess for children? And the last question, then you, you have to say yes or no, is should there be silence in the classroom when you teach chess or not? So, I divide you into four. The focus is on winning and not on learning. So, it, what is important is to have this new uh, term, maybe you have heard it, about grit. It's a very popular now in psychology about grit. It's a long-term uh, goal when you do something to develop, to learn on the long-term goal. And what I think that you keep, the talk, what you call talk about here, keeping enthusiasm and how to keep hunger for learning more knowledge is about this with grit. To have a long-term strategy to learn, the eager to learn. And I think that if you focus too much on winning the game, if it's like a very competitive environment, this might happen that they lose their interest if they start to lose games and so on. And if I, from my point of view, the key is to focus on the learning process, to get the feeling that you develop, then you can keep this. But I know this is, of course, not so easy. Not at least a lot of kids are very competitive. Because in the future, what, you, what is needed is skills, how to receive facts, how to understand all the transformation that our society is inside because the future there's so many interesting things happen with artificial intelligence the optimization and so on and then the, the children need skills to be able to cope. I believe in the future it's so important to be able to concentrate more than only three minutes you know you have to be able to concentrate for a long time and chess I think is fantastic for this train they will not be able to concentrate and then you come with chess and they get so captivated that they, like you say, so concentrated and you have found a way to reach them. And that I think is also because of this with gamification. You capture the children with a game 
and that makes them concentrated in another way. So a room of concentration. In this room, when you play chess, the children will get the chance to learn how to concentrate. And I can tell you, I've been to many, many classes in Sweden. This is a problem that you are facing as a teacher, just to keep, you know, how to find a room for concentration. So as you will see later, I say that when you tr learn chess and so on, I agree with you. There must be cooperation, they must talk and so on. But what I do is that when they play a game, when you have some kind of tournament, then I say, then now we try to make this room of concentration. So then you only speak with small letters, okay? And then you try only also only ask questions about the position, so you do not complain about your neighbor or something like that. But one year ago, I had this course in Italy for Italian teachers. And I said that now it should be silent in the room, we make a room of concentration. All the Italian teachers were very upset. They said, oh no, what do you mean? If, the, if it's silent, it's boring, you know? Of course, it should be a lot of loud and speaking and so on. Then the children love what they do. So they didn't understand this with a room of concentration. That's why I wanted to ask you. So again, you can go with the Swedish method to try to make a room of concentration or the Italian method, a room of chaotic <laughs> stimulation. You choose yourself. I just wanted to check what you say. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now we move on. So, from my point of view, I think chess has got many good benefits. First of all, in the way I present this in this course, you can see that chess can be a very social game. It can be an interactive cooperation, like you said. It could also be uh, a cognitive tool to train the brain in different ways. And as you can see, in connection to this, and this is something I have realized many times, it can also give children the confidence that they can think. A lot of children are afraid, you said you're a mathematics teacher, you said, a lot of children are afraid of mathematics because they don't have the confidence that I am smart, I can think. But when they play the game, suddenly they realize that I can play chess, I'm, I'm smart, I can also do mathematics. They give the, you give them the confidence that they have cognitive skills. And I think also chess is fantastic because it crosses all barriers. It doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't matter if you uh, don't know the language. In Sweden, for example, we work a lot of chess with um, refugees coming to Sweden and they don't know Swedish, but they can be part of our chess tournaments because chess crosses all borders. Then you said developing logic, encourage creativity. It also, in a way, you have to learn how to behave in a disciplined way. I think also it's very easy to teach. You said, you said before here that you wanted to show how easy it is to teach, um, to teach chess because there's a myth that it's very difficult. And I really think it can be easy. I will show you later what I believe in. Then of course, and it's inexpensive. I think that's always when I come to schools and start to talk about chess, they are afraid of the costs. But all of us know that a chess set doesn't cost much money, and that's actually something that is fantastic with chess, that it's so cheap. In the end, and this is probably the most important thing, chess is so fun. Children love to play chess. And you that are teachers, you know how important it is to have a pedagogic situation where children will love what they do. A lot of, of uh, teachers can use chess as a spice in their different uh, subjects. Uh, it can be not the least in mathematics, but also in all other subjects, somehow you can find connections to the game. Then of course, uh, the, uh, one important question, and not the least when we look at Europe, where it looks different, chess uh, can be used in different educational contexts. And questions to ask yourself when you look at your country and the way you do it is, is it supplementary or is it mandatory? Do you understand this? 
Uh, is it by choice of the children, I want to have chess, or should everyone have chess? And you working with kids, you know that this is such a big difference. If a child chooses to come to chess themselves, or if they are forced to have it, it's quite a big difference. Then, of course, is it a curriculum lessons, lesson planned for a teacher, or is it after school club, where it's more free play, that's also something that should be a distinction? Is it a competitive game that we choose to have? Or is it a scholastic, more focusing on other uh, skills that you can uh, reach by playing chess? And then, of course, is chess an enrichment? Is it for young kids, early years? Is it for children with special needs? That also makes the context of how to teach chess different. Okay, before we go into the course, I also want to tell you a little bit about ECU. ECU education that is behind this course and this event is actually started 1985. It started because uh, they felt that they needed some kind of interest group inside uh, FIDE that could represent the countries of Europe. Uh, one very important thing for chess in schools inside ECU was in 2012. And for me, this was a great thing. Then the European Parliament declared that the member states should encourage chess in schools. It was actually uh, Mr. Kasparov and uh, the president then, Danilo, who managed to do this uh, hard lobbying to get this declaration. The president, Zora Basmaitparashvili, is actually here. He has been very supportive to this movement, Chess in Schools. So, our target, Chess Education Commission, is to help the CIS organizations of Europe. We try to help all the countries how to develop and try to encourage them to continue with Chess in Schools. We are promoting visiting and lobbying for Chess in Schools. We are both attending several education conferences and not the least arranging a lot, of, a lot of chess in school conferences. We have this certificate that you are at now and we also created in the very beginning an academic board, advisory board, that is uh, make sure that everything that we do is in line with what the schools are wanting to have and not the least the school plans of the different countries of Europe. When I started, I soon realized that chess in school was a bit chaotic all over Europe. Every country made it in their own way. And if uh, those of you who are chess trainers know that every country, every trainer is the probably the best one in the world. You know, it's, it's very difficult to have these kind of cooperations and so on because everyone is the best. Still, we needed to understand how does it really look like? What does it look like? How does it work? And this is the survey we did, and this is, was the result of uh, this work, this survey. Can see it now. Uh, as you can see, uh, quite a lot of Europe has got a very high activity of chess in schools. Uh, today, I would say that not that it's Norway, chess in school is about to explode due to the Magnus Carlsen effect, but also a lot of other countries, most of them have high activity of chess in schools. What is interesting is, of course, to see if there is a national curriculum, if there is one way of doing it. And as you can see, it's there you can see a quite a lot of differences, not the least in these countries where you have a lot of different organizations working in parallel and where the federation is not in charge. And I think this is probably the key to this. Is there a federation in charge? Normally there is a curriculum, normally they have one way of doing it. And here you can see what we found out in the uh, survey we did. Um, for example, in Germany it's a regional based, it's not based on the country. In Sweden we have only one chess in schools, the federation is in charge. Just like in Spain, uh, the chess, uh, FEDA is in charge of uh, chess in schools. So, uh, the federation involvement is very high. So, one quite other question I think is what's interesting is if chess is a sport in the country. 
And you can see that in quite a lot of um, uh, countries of Europe, chess is regarded as a sport. And for us in Sweden, for example, you can see it's very blue. We are not regarded as a sport. And of course, in the end, it's all about money. You know, the sports federations, they don't want to be, uh, in Sweden, for example, they don't want us to be part of the, the sports federation, the, the national sport federation, because that means we have to get a lot of money from, because we, we are, have quite a huge federation now with all chess in schools. So they're trying everything that they do to keep us away, what they can, you know. Norway is a big exception. They are the uh, sports federation asking chess to become part of sports, but they say no. <laughs> because they are so strong these days with Magnus Carlsen. So that's an exception. In the rest of the Europe, mostly the federations try to be regarded as a sport and to get the same conditions as other sports. Other survey conclusions that we could make from this survey, and this was made in 2015-16, chess in school is a very rapid growing movement. Today we believe that it's about seven to eight million kids having chess in schools every week in the countries of Europe. Compare that with that we have 250,000 players on the ELO list. That's, that's what we have for ELO lists in Europe. We have 8 million playing chess in schools, 250,000 on the ELO list. That is the difference of today. There is, though, a big diversity in how chess in school is implemented. It's regarding if it's an organization in charge, if it's a federation. It depends on how the school system works, what educational methods that are used. It's not the least about the goal. Is it to get talents? Or is it to develop kids? Is it about making uh, stars? Is it about making a movement? So, is it uh, instructors going to schools? Is it teachers? There are a lot of factors making it uh, different. So, uh, still, what was needed, what we found out, that it's important to find a standard, the, uh, as high standard as possible, for how to teach chess in the schools of Europe. And also it's very important to make chess regarded as an important pedagogic tool. If we can make our governments not only look at chess as a game, but actually it's as a tool, then we we'll suddenly will have more open doors from schools, for money, from educational authorities. And to do that, we realized that there was a need for a training and for a certification of didactic skills. My view, on my view, is that all around Europe now, there's quite a lot of good materials. Almost every country has got their own materials, own books on chess. Most of them are quite good. What is lacking, what everyone is fighting with, is how to actually teach, how to use this material in a good way. And that is why we have this course that you are in today. So, when the, it comes to this national chess curriculum, it's, uh, it, each country, of course, determining uh, its own national curriculum. It differs, if we look at what it looks like right, right now, uh, according to didactic styles, education system, and national chess culture. The curriculums, uh, Nearly always these methods and curriculums cover the basics and uh, include teacher resources and pupil workbooks. That's normally what it looks like. Most curricula, though, from my opinion, lack didactic, didactical methods and that's what's needed. 